I have to admit this is kind of crazy that I even allowed myself to get into this. And I don't remember how it happened actually, but at some point, um, since I really love the Screw Tape Proposes a Toast piece that C.S. Lewis wrote, and I was captivated by his book, uh, Surprised by Joy, and I haven't really read much else of uh, C.S. Lewis. So I'm by no means an expert on that. And, and I just said, well, an Augustinian. I mean, I couldn't put um, St. Augustine. So I said, well, an Augustinian proposes a toast in an effort to try to kind of walk into that particular um, chapter, um, epilogue of, of the book, Screw Tape, Select, the Screw Tape Letters, and hopefully um, offer what I'm offering will come come clear with the question. Um, so on Monday night, I asked the question at the very end of the uh, celebration. I said, well, why in the world did you choose to do it from the point of view of the devil? Why not do what he wanted to do from the point of view of heaven, of an angel? And the speaker said, um, in so many words that, um, well, he probably has also done that in the great divorce, at least somewhere. I looked at that, I couldn't really find it, so it, it is what it is. But it seemed to me that one of the easiest things to do is to talk about evil, things that are bad. And if you stop, if, when I stop to think about what I meditate on, at least in the first place, I'm always thinking first about the things I, that maybe looked up. You know, the things that, that I did that were bad. And I spend a lot more time, and I find that people spend a lot more time thinking about the things that have gone wrong than talking about the things that have gone right. And part of that has to be the fact that nobody wants to be proud. I, I know, I'm, I'm really important sort of thing. And it's almost as if nobody wants to believe that their life could really be that good. And so for C.S. Lewis to begin this conversation, which apparently um, around July 19th or 20, 21 of 1940, he got this idea of sending regular columns to an Anglican uh, journal in, that was published in, um, in England called The Guardian. No longer, it no longer exists as a journal. And so over a period of about six months, you know, one chapter after another, um, presumably engaging the people in a way that was so impressive that somebody decided it needed to be a book. And 1959, the, the um, Saturday Evening Post got him to do a sequel. So it's many years thereafter that he, that he did this screw tape proposes a toast and I see it in some ways as a bit of a summary of what the screw tech letters were really all about. Um, and some of the best lines, but not all of the good lines are, are in it. Um, but it, it, it portrays this sense of um, getting people to think about temptation and the methods the events, the ways, the means that people give into temptation. And so the, the whole toast is like, you know, dumb them down. Make sure they don't think they're anything special. Make sure that they keep we keep them mediocre. Because this this meal that we are sharing together and the occasion, of course, is um, Tentress College um, is preparing for graduation and screw tape has been invited back to give the, um, the address at, at dinner. He complains, obviously, about the, the, the food because it's just little sinners that um, are, are not really very tasty at all, and um, laments the fact that we no longer have the great sinners. And the line that always captivated me from the first time I read it was, and great sinners make great saints. Because it, 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 it brings so beautifully true that if you're, if you're really committed to something, 
some of the guys who went through the seminary who ended up being the best were the ones who cheated the most. You know, staying out a little bit or doing this or doing that. Um, and who often got caught, but it was never bad enough to be expelled from the seminary. But it's, it's like, if you're not willing to take a chance, um, you don't really know who you are. And if you don't really allow yourself um, to be dedicated to something, even if it happens to be evil, hopefully, thankfully, none of the guys I knew at the seminary were dedicated to evil, but uh, you know, if, you're, if you're not dedicated to doing things that are, are, are really bad, um, but you're dedicated somehow to something, well, the chance of you um, learning how to undo or not give into temptation are greater. Because when you put yourself in the middle of something, you know, like me trying to put myself here in this room, thinking that I've got something that's really important to all of you, um, and, and trying to find the words that will put it out there, it's, it's not that it's good or bad in and of itself, but it's taking a chance. And whether that be taking a chance of something that's not great or bad, or whether it's taking a chance of something good, that's precisely the way temptation gets undone. So as group tape says, dumb them down. Make sure they think of themselves as one of this group. You know, after all, a democracy is supposed to be everybody's equal. Everybody's worth the same. Everybody's just as good as the other. But don't let anybody stand out. Because as soon as somebody stands out, either for good or for bad, you begin to have a capacity to think at a deeper level. And so, you know, whether it be um, clear sin or not, it, it, it ends up being something that kind of pushes people to think more deeply. So like, when I hear people's confessions, um, I'm, I'm really grateful when people have not just given me a, a list that they've been repeating for years, because it shows not that they're good or bad people, but that they've taken the bad stuff they've done seriously. And say, I'm going to learn from that. And so Screwtape wants to make sure that that doesn't happen. Get them seeing how everybody else does it. Make sure that it's, you're just one of the crowd. You know, it says, oh, well, everybody else is doing it. Why should not? Sort of thing. And much of the talk is, is centered right there. So whether it's language about democracy, kind of makes everybody equal in his way of using democracy, that is, in the di diabolical definition of democracy that he gives, um, or just whether it be the, the way they think of themselves. Um, I think a really perfect example of how the strategy of screw tape works is caught up in the word a white lie. This is a white lie, and even if I did it for good reasons, you know, preserve somebody else's reputation. I don't, if, I'm, if I don't call it a lie, I don't really pause to think about it or learn anything about well, why did I do that? Could I have done it differently? What if I had chosen different words? Could still preserve a person's reputation without lying. So we wants to make sure that there are little phrases, little actions like that, that are just make sure people don't ever get a chance to come to terms with who they are, and what they've done, and where they're going. And so why do we choose the devils? Well, it's a lot easier to talk about the things that that we um, a lot easier. It's a lot more immediate to talk about the things we've done poorly than it is to think about the things that we've done well. There's another little, what I call the 20% um, rule. I'm waiting on that. <laughs> is it hard? Nah, it's just going to be fun. The 20% rule. So I used to talk to Mary. Uh, couples who were married and they were having problems and you know, they said, well, remember, every time there's something that makes your life 
relationship to one another bad. You've got to do four things to make it good. Which appears to be absolutely absurd. But once the bad things go beyond 20% in any relationship, especially a marriage relationship, that relationship is in trouble. So for every one, you need four. And that, that very much applies to community life, you know, Augustinian life, same, same deal. Um, when, when a relationship with somebody, it, it just keeps getting worse, or you, you haven't found a way to do a couple of things that will kind of bridge the gap of strong words spoken or of uh, obligations not uh, lived up to, well, it, it makes things worse. So by, by focusing on keeping everything below the real, what Screwtape is really trying to do is to make sure that, well, we just go along the crowd. You know, we, well, I mean, I, I had to tell a lie. I hurt somebody's reputation. Yeah, okay. What did you learn from that? Oh, you didn't learn anything from that. So you could just do it again and not think about it again. And that's what screw tape is trying to do. And the, the cleverness of um, of his toast in trying to say, you know, this this menu, this food that we're eating may not sound all that great, but it really is. Because it's not the taste, but the fact that we are depriving the enemy of what he wants most. He wants to save everybody. And so the satisfaction of being able to do something that the enemy doesn't want it may not taste great, but we're doing what we're supposed to do. Scrutin's fears. His first fear is that people will begin to think about what's right or wrong. They'll have some kind of a conscience, an awareness that what they did really is not a good thing. And when I look around at my life, my experience, the people I've worked with, conscience, an awareness of what one has done, is always, always, always focused only on the bad stuff. Examine your conscience. I learned as a kid. Every night, well, it gets a little heavy at times. Um, and nobody ever said, examine your conscience and notice the good stuff. And in the Augustinian tradition, um, you're not being you're you're not being humble if you don't recognize the good stuff. I did this. I did that. Since the, for an Augustinian, or for a human being, you always have to add the phrase by the grace of God. And if I notice the good stuff that I've done, or not just do the, you know, the, the balance sheet of, you know, I did this wrong, and well, I was compensated by, no, but if I notice the bad stuff, but I also notice the good stuff, what am I noticing but the presence of God in my life? So that's why Shrutev doesn't want anybody to think. Just go along. Just everybody else does it. So to become aware how the good stuff isn't like, hey, look what I did. It's look what God is doing with me. And I never would have been able to do that without the grace of God. And so it begins to be a kind of a, a personal fashioning of one's own book of the confessions. Noticing how, again and again, where things were, were bad, <coughs> looked bad, um, didn't seem to come together, still began to notice there was somehow a connecting um, thread that run th ran through his life, but each of our lives. And the very thing that Screwtape doesn't want to happen is that we begin to see that thread, how it works out. We always see ourselves in terms of the 
the other people are just as good as we are. Or I'm just as good as you are. C.S. Lewis says, and you know, nobody ever says that unless they don't, unless they have worries about whether or not it's true. So the other thing that um, screw tape is afraid of is that if people start to think, they might also begin to repent. Desires change. To be led to forgive. To enter into the decisions they make not simply from the point of view of this is right and this is wrong, or I did it, but so what? Nothing happened. Um, but in terms of the relationship, how do I, in fact, connect to the person next to me? And nowhere did I find in any of the, um, or I should say, always you find that what C.S. Lewis is doing is he's choosing the relationships that can be made to sour in some way, shape, or form, you know, whether it's your mother-in-law, or someone else in the house, or someone you have to deal with on the road. And, and that's across so many of his works, including The Great Divorce, um, that his concern is that whatever those relationships are, they be used for everybody to notice things that are not working. And if you throw repentance in there, all of a sudden, you put something there that one of my brothers always used to call the glue of a relationship, a friendship. Forgiveness is the glue of friendship. You, you really never can't have a friendship unless both people can deal with the, the question of change and forgiveness of one another. And the third thing that is kind of obvious for the things I've already said is he wants to make sure that nobody becomes excellent at anything. Do not stand out. Do not let anybody else stand out. If everybody in the class is done okay, they all get A's. Because that way I don't have to distinguish anybody. And, and if there's no sense of excellence, there's no sense of, um, you know, I want to be the person that I have been called to be. Well, it's much easier to be tempted to do X or Y without giving it an awful lot of thought, which in substance is diabolic, because it subverts the one thing that we have that we are. You know, I am who I am, you are who you are. Um, and, and so there's, for anyone to subvert or to undercut my sense of my own Individuality, worth, gift is is to um, is to give in the wiles of of the devil. Um, so you never hear talk about friendship in the screen tape letters. It's always a relationship that's on the edge of going somewhere else. He never talks about a relationship that's working towards being better, growing. In, in respect, esteem, depth, um, and appreciation. Um, you never hear talk about common good. That, that there might be something that's good for everyone. Except, in a diabolic way, for the community the screw tape is addressing, look at how much good we can do for ourselves. Only we can make um, make sure that these this becomes our meal. And we thrive on whatever evil they do. So keep them away from care for neighbor, sense of common good, an awareness of friendship. I'm never talking about that. I'm never letting you become primary. You said it would be short and sweet. Well, you know, leave some time for some it's questions. Better conversation. Yeah. You guys have got someplace other things you want to do. Right? Mm -hmm. Me too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah.
but I'm, I certainly was not going to run into the basketball game. But who has who has some comments? You know, throw something on the table for take a chance to uh, enliven the conversation more than I could. I'll speak at once. <laughs> sense. So when you shake your head a couple of times, it's like, yeah, I get that. Yeah. <laughs> oh, well, um, you say it's really important to that, uh, that, for example, in relationships, uh, you have that 20% of the acts are not, that it's less than 20%, but that wouldn't that be like also hiding the evil? Apart from the relationship, well, part of the part of the process of, of making the good predominate is to cover over the evil, but it doesn't mean you can ignore it or, or just kind of hide it. It's so much. No, you're you're going to um, cover it with something good, not make it disappear. And so, presumably, the the bad stuff we've done, we remember it for a while because we really don't. You know, if we've started to cover it over with good, part of the reason here isn't that you know we don't learn anything. It's okay. I got caught in that trap. I'm not going to get caught in that trap again. Um, now, remember that's a theory, 20% rule. I, in my experience, it works. Um, I've heard, I got that from a psychologist that that ought to work. So. Still play with it. It's not like it's an ironclad sort of thing, but I think it makes a lot of sense to uh, not just kind of examine the bad stuff, but to look at the good stuff and see where you want to go, not what you want, what you want to go with. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Any other comments? Anybody have a good joke? <laughs> oh, I don't have a joke. Sorry. <laughs> um, so the whole time you were talking, I thought this was really interesting and really good in all kinds of different ways. Um, but the whole time that you were talking, the word that kept coming to mind and the word that you didn't say but was there was attention. So in all these different ways, it seems like um, what Screwtape doesn't want is for us to pay attention right. to what we're doing. And I think that's really helpful because I think sometimes we think uh, what we need to do is like learn the rules and follow them. But what you're suggesting is, no, it's not just a matter of rules, it's a matter of paying attention to who you really are and then the rest of it sort of falls into place. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if you have, I, I, my question is, um, when you were talking this started to seem like an especially timely piece because I think a lot of us really struggle with attention right now. Um, so do you have anything to say about that? You know, it, it, distraction is just huge. Yeah. You know, I, mean, you know, I, I started on electronic stuff back in 1980. Um, my first computer was a Sanyo with two five and a quarter inch floppy drives that I could do anything I wanted with. Um, <laughs> and now with the internet, and that really is only around for what? Like, less than 25 or about 25 years that we've, that we've had this access to the, to the internet. Um, I mean, I, I open up the computer, I can go anywhere. And it's scary sometimes. But, you know, you, you go to the New York Times, or you go someplace, you get a story, and it's like, yeah, but I should be doing this. No, but that's interesting. So, yeah, attention, um, kind of sorting out where I need to put my attention um, doesn't end up being, I think, a crucial piece behind C.S. Lewis's talk. I, I don't know whether any of you read his um, biography, Surprised by Joy. Um, and there's, toward the end, as he's getting close to the, to the time of his conversion, he says, and there I was, in, in my study. And I could feel the enemy getting closer and closer. And I felt as though I was being dragged <coughs> to the gates of heaven. 
with my eyes darting to the right and to the left, looking for any way out, and there was none. I don't know if you remember the story, but it's like, uh, obviously I, I like the story, I wouldn't have remembered it, but it, 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 it's like um, his attentiveness, even to the fact that he was being drawn to a place he did not want to go. But he was so, he, he, he's able to explain it or express it in emotional terms. Not just in a neat thought about, you know, this is what happened, but he's able to capture the emotion of somehow being dragged into a faith that he didn't really want to have at all. And, and, and I think with all of the distractions out there, we often miss occasions to see what's really happening. I mean, think of what happens when you have an argument with a good friend. And you, you separate, you move away from one another. How many times do I, do you, rerun the conversation? But now I'm in charge of both sides, so I always win. Right? So my friend was was wrong because I, but but I should have said this, and then it would all have been fine. And, and it's kind of this attention pulled into a very narrow box until you let go of it, you know, and, and say, well, wait a minute, we're we're two human beings. We had a fight. The only way back is to say, I'm sorry even if I wasn't at fault. Then I can put my attention in a different place, because our attention is always somewhere. And, and, and I think the, 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 the sense that, that it was behind my words, that I think that's an accurate comment, that the, the tension was, was behind there. If I'm paying attention to the fact that there's nobody in the world like me, I mean, there is nobody just like me, or you, or anybody. And I said, okay, if I'm that unique, what is it and how is it that I pay attention to the things that matter for me and for those around me? When I preach on Sunday, I, I sometimes ask the question, what does God love about you? It's just a really fascinating question. I, I don't come to the end of it even in my own life, but it's like, what, what does God love about you? Because if you're attentive to that, and that's what you want to love. You know, pay attention to. It. And that and that's where you become or I become the person I'm supposed to be. And that could possibly be more interesting than Reddit. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> well, I think it's more interesting than being this great success where you don't have a chance to pay attention because your flashbulbs are going off or the yeah. um, you know, the interviews are happening and you don't ever get a chance to say who are you. That was one of the things that got, I think, a big laugh from you all during the play when that one slide went up with Facebook and Twitter and Instagram on it. Right? You all got the distraction. Yeah, it was funny. Yeah. Uh, and what my students told me was on Tuesday they changed the line about murder or cards to murder or Facebook. I don't know who was there on Tuesday, but made it more of art mm -hmm. that if you can leave them to hell that way, then why not Facebook? And there, were, there was no laughter. No laughter. <laughs> at, at that line. Mm -hmm. Well, we know. I mean, when we're doing stuff, it's distracting us from other stuff. We're not, we're not conscious, but we know it in our gut somehow. Okay. I have a, perhaps a related question. So you said that um, screw tape and screw tape proposes a toast um, encourages these near graduates of the Tucker's College to. Um, uh, encourage this blind equality and democracy don't fit in lowest common denominator dumb them down um do you see that in the 21st century maybe even making it more professional home do you see that happening? because um on one hand it seems that villanova has a culture of no. Ignite change and be successful. Um, uh, excellence with all the Augustinian values. But then there's also this other culture of do as little work as possible to get the best grade as possible and have as much 
god-awful fun as you can in the process. What would be your take on those words in terms of reflecting? So I, I left Villanova in 1997, came back in 2009, taught in Rome, the uh, Patristic Institute. Um, and people would ask me, well, what do you see different in the students? Um, um, when you start in a different place, professors are a bit overworked and don't seem to be around quite as often for the friendly exchange, the moment of you know, a cup of coffee or something. So I, I think there's a certain intensity, at least among the, the professors that I knew and that I know, um, over that period of time. And I, I said to um, my first answer to that question about students, where uh, the students are smarter and they're more, more emotionally fragile. Um, I'm not sure I can adequately sum up exactly what that means, but it was clear to me that the that the the level of engagement had changed. And then later on came to realize that one of the huge changes over that period was ACS. Villanova is a different place now that they have the ACS program, because it was not in place when I left in 97. It, it's something called Core Humanities. It was kind of beginning to start, and I was helping to contribute to the Augustine part of that. Um, at the beginning, but then I left in 97, and it just, it, it, when did ACS formally start? Was it 02 or no? I think it was 2010, yeah. It was a couple years later anyway, but it, uh, so when I came back, it was clear that not only were students in a better place, probably because of the seminar format, where people can get to know one another and talk about ideas and not just about what happened yesterday or the day before. Um, and the emotionally fragile piece was, it seemed to me that I was spending more time trying to reassure students that it was okay to take this course with me, and it was okay to be honest with me. Um, so, you know, somebody would hand me the, um, the absence slip from, from the, um, the health center. I said, you know, I, I don't need that. I need your work. Um, and you know, it took a while to, to convince them that this was a this was a relationship. This was a human relationship, not just a you know. Of course, I have to go through and do you know dance through this hoop and jump over that hurdle to get through it. But th there was there was something else had to go on there, and and I found that um, in the 80s and early 90s, it was a lot easier to do that than it was when I came back in uh, 2009. So that's where I, that's where the word emotionally more fragile came from. Whether it's the right word, I don't know. Um, love to hear somebody give me another one. If there's a, if a better way to say that. But I was I was experiencing greater difficulty in making the emotional connection. So I don't know whether that really answered the question, but anybody else? Yeah, um, this is like a little, but what um, specifically attracts you to Lewis's writing? Um, I, I think because I read Surprise by Joy first, and and I just, you know, as somebody who um, grew up on the Confessions, as it were, to read someone else's story of conversion, and since Lewis was basically an atheist, I mean, I've always found that conversations with atheists are so fascinating because they've had to spend so much energy justifying their position. And so they're not going to let you off easy with, you know, the quick answer or the, um, the, the, the pat answer. Um, so to read the, the, the story of Lewis going through that whole process got me engaged. Now, I know a bunch of professors use mere Christianity. I've never read mere Christianity. I should probably be ashamed, but I've never, I've never read it. It's supposed to be a really good book. Um, and then I discovered the, the screw tape, uh, screw tape proposes a toast was published in 1959. Was, I was a freshman at Villanova. Physics major, of all things. <laughs> um, you're a physics major? Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's that's how I started. Um, but then, when I, when, in those days, in the seminary, you had no choice. So when I joined the seminary the following year, I was a philosophy major. Got stuck, obviously. So. 
that, does that really answer the question? <laughs> Any other? Yeah. Okay, so one thing that um, it appears that um, screw tape kind of like laments throughout uh, a lot of the letters is that it's actually like really hard to be a tempter, kind of. Really hard to. It's like hard. It's like he kind of plays it. It's like it's easy for um, people to kind of like go towards God and go into the enemy's camp, as he says it. Do you think that that's something that isn't really that isn't said enough in all our literature? I think that's probably accurate. Um, we paint the spiritual life as if it's really hard. Um, we don't often talk enough about how easy it is to, to learn to be yourself. Uh, although it can be pretty challenging to do that too, it's a lot harder to uh, run away. So yeah, that's a, I think that's a really, um, I mean, that, that in some way was behind my talk, um, but I hadn't put it in, those, in that context. I think you're right. We don't talk enough about I mean, be who you are. That's that's the beauty of, of what's going on. Um, so it's it's difficult when people get distracted thinking that they need to be part of this group or they need to be supported in that way or they, they need to hide because otherwise they wouldn't have the, the, the way to react. Um, and that's when friends are really needed because good friends would kind of help you to grow up. At least that's my experience. Um, I'm not sure that's all of our experience. <laughs> Um, I think that's good. All right, thank you, Father. Um, don't worry if you want to come up and say something no, no, afterwards. No, no. Father Allen teaches upper level theology classes that you know they have taken upper level at some point. Registration is coming. So this semester I have a graduate course, next semester I'll have a Okay. And in the fall, I'm not sure what they're going to give me. Probably, I think I have another graduate course again. Okay. This past fall, then the following fall, I'll have another. You'll have an upper level. Upper level. Look, it's so fun. Augustine now and then. I'm here. We met a couple of weeks ago. You're welcome.